Good evening, and welcome to the Jewish National Fund's Women for Israel event, The Power of Women, The Power of Friendship. Good evening, I'm Marcy Robinson, and along with Melissa Siegel, are the co-chairs of Women for Israel for Central New Jersey. We thank you for your friendship and support in helping to make Israel the best it can be. We hope you enjoy this interactive evening. Thank you for joining us. Hello ladies and welcome again to tonight's Women for Israel event. My name is Michelle Nyer and I'm proud to be one of the co-chairs tonight along with Barbara London, Maida Richland and Nancy Waldenberg. We are led by our wonderful Women for Israel chairs, Marcy Robinson and Melissa Siegel. It has been an honor to have worked with this group of women for the past two years. I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge our central New Jersey president, Alyssa Russo. As we celebrate the power of women tonight, it is important to note that Alyssa is our first female president in this area. She is a woman I look up to and respect for being a leader with strength and commitment, but also kindness. It is hard to believe that just a year ago, many of us were together in person, celebrating each other and raising support for Jewish National Fund. The times have changed tremendously, but what remains constant is the power of our friendships. At the start of the COVID crisis, we lost a dear friend, Marsha Henry. Marsha was one of the co-chairs of this event last year, and to see that she was truly incredible is an understatement. I only had the blessing of knowing Marsha for less than a year, but she changed my life for the better and will be forever remembered. My guess is there are many others who would say the same. Marsha was the epitome of friendship, kindness, generosity, and warmth. She could give a hug that made you smile for days and encouraged everyone to do bigger and better things. She had a beautiful voice and one of the highlights of last year's event was hearing Marcia sing. Marcia was passionate about JNF and helping the state of Israel. As I gathered my thoughts for this event, it was Marcia's wide smile and bright eyes that came to mind. She was an unbelievable source of enthusiasm and encouragement for us last year. I think many would say that they can still feel her energy, but that sense was especially strong in preparing for this evening. Marcia had so many skills, talents, and interests, but I think the one that stood out the most was her gift for making everyone in her presence feel comfortable and warm. As soon as Marcia met you, you were her friend. Please consider tonight a dedication and a promise to Marcia that we will continue to honor and remember her by supporting each other, being kind, embracing everyone with warmth, and of course, being good friends. Anytime we can gather a group of women like this for a common purpose, there's a tremendous strength and the results will be amazing. Marcia, I'm confident, is proud of all of us right now. Thank you again for attending tonight and for your support of Jewish National Fund. We promise you that tonight would be unique and unlike any other ordinary Zoom call. Let's take this opportunity to be inspired, to strengthen existing friendships and build new ones as we move forward with a common goal to support each other and the state of Israel. Wishing you all health, enjoy the program. My name is Titi Aenal, and I was born in Ethiopia. Life there was not easy. I always dream of moving to Israel. My brother and I became orphans, and we made Aliyah to Natania to live with my grandparents. I didn't know the language. It was hard. I little served as an officer on the IDF, commanding over 300 soldiers. Looking for a way to effect social change, I entered the Miss Israel pageant, and I won. It put me on the path of being able to represent different sectors of Israeli society. Today I meet with people all over and talk about the thousands of things that Israel does that make the world a better place. I am Noazir. I live in Moshev Paran, in the center of Arava. 
with my husband and two children. The Arava is a special place. It is beautiful, but harsh. Very hot and dry, with barely an inch of rain for a year. Yes, it is remote, with a small population, but you have never met a tighter knit, more caring community. My family is second generation farmers. We are pioneers. I'm working to bring change to the region. We now have a new medical center, so people don't have to travel two hours each way for medical care. You can't imagine the difference that makes in a mother's life. I, Dorit Friedman, made Aliyah to Israel from the US shortly after college. I went alone without much of a safety net or a support network. And so we formed Nefesh Benefesh to revolutionize the way people immigrate to Israel. And we've done it. We've brought 55,000 people to Israel. And we've quadrupled the retention rate to over 90%. Today, as VP of Strategic Partnerships for Nefesh Benefesh, I work with young, passionate professionals who are part of the burgeoning technology field, who are staffing hospitals, who are creating businesses, and who are pumping money into the Israeli economy, who have infused over $1 billion of economic benefit to Israel. I am Myra Chak Fleischer. I am a mother, a wife, a daughter, an attorney. I am a Jewish National Fund woman for Israel. And together, we women of all ages are changing lives and ensuring the land of Israel and its people are prosperous and strong. Today, women are the backbone of the U.S. economy. We are educated, we work or own businesses, we raise our families. On top of that, we find time to give back and are engaged in various philanthropic activities. We make a difference. Join me and the thousands of other women and make your mark with Jewish National Fund's Women for Israel. It is my honor and privilege to have this opportunity to speak to so many women across the country this evening. I continue to be constantly inspired by all that JNF does from the North to the South and everything in between. I'm especially proud of the power of Women for Israel of the Jewish National Fund. This is the part of the program that they traditionally call the ask. I have to be honest, I'm not really very good at asking people for money. What I'm very comfortable doing is having a tell. And that is a tell about what the JNF has meant to me. I'd like to tell you why I devote my time, my passion, my energy, and yes, my money to JNF. I am proud to be a Sapphire Society member, and my husband Bruce just recently was one of the first to join the newly created Eretz Society. My journey to Zionism started in 1973 while I was a student studying at Hebrew University during the Yom Kippur War. That was a very long time ago. As a fourth generation American college kid who lost no one in the Holocaust, had never visited Israel with my family, and probably the only Hebrew I knew was Shalom and my memorized bat mitzvah speech. I felt immediately connected from the moment that the plane landed in this amazing land that I cannot even describe why I had these feelings and connections. And it was a feeling that has forever changed my Jewish identity and my life. Faster forward now about 45 years, and I was invited to a JNF breakfast right here in central New Jersey. By the way, does anybody on this call still think that JNF is about planting trees and that's all it's about? Or maybe that it is something to do with water conservation? Well, about five years ago when I attended this breakfast, that was pretty much what I thought about JNF. Well, there's a whole lot more to learn about JNF. And I walked into the synagogue 
room, auditorium, and I was suddenly in a room with 300 like-minded Zionists, and I learned about the far-reaching work of the Jewish National Fund. I learned about affiliate groups in Israel that address the water, excuse me, the water shortage and Israel's unprecedented response to the recycling of water, leading the world by recycling 93% of its water. I learned about a program called Special in Uniform that allows young people with disabilities to have a role in the army and be counted as soldiers in uniform, even if it didn't mean fighting in a war or battlefield. As you may know, so much of Israeli culture and identity is tied to one's army service. Heretofore, the exclusion of this population could not share this very significant rite of passage. Can you appreciate what it might mean to a young special needs person and their family getting their first paycheck from the Israeli army? I learned about nature programs for disabled, guards who protect kibbutzim from being robbed and pilfered by hostile neighbors. I visited the JNF Sderot indoor playground in the Gaza envelope where children are provided shelter with a purpose, activities, and even music lessons to divert from and assuage the fear of hundreds of rockets that are being sent by Gaza seemingly at will. I literally wept at this site for two reasons. One was pride in the genius and creativity of this multi-purpose indoor miklat or shelter known as a recreation center. And the second reason I cried was that we even needed such a shelter to escape to for our children who have a 15 second warning before a rocket drops or a balloon is disguised and a bomb goes off. The list goes on and on. And if you think JNF just plants trees, please do not leave this evening with that misconception. If you visit the JNF website, you will feel both an amazing sense of pride at how Israel has not only miraculously survived for the last 72 years, but also bear witness to how it has thrived. And much of that thriving is a result of JNF involvement and the women on this Zoom tonight. And then I learned about another JNF affiliate called Macomb from our friends, Beth and Jules Cohn, and soon after met Shosh Mitzman, the professional working in Israel with this affiliate group. I had the most difficult decision to make on to which task force I would choose to get involved in. A task force is really an immersion into a single JNF affiliate program that touches your heart, your interest, or just your curiosity. By the way, you may or may not know that with JNF, you can actually direct or designate where you would like your contribution to go. So it can be split between a favorite project or just the general campaign. Let's face it, women, many of us are involved in many charities, both Jewish and not. Part of my tell to you is why JNF touches my heart more than all the others that I have supported. It reignites that indescribable feeling I had in 1973, that I belonged to a people and a land that I hardly knew and defied all logic. It is the only Jewish charity that is 100% dedicated to the land and the people of Eretz Yisrael. Everything JNF USA does is integral to the vision and mission of building and connecting the land and creating a better quality of life for every Israeli citizen. Whether it's water, buying fire trucks, supporting people to move to the north and south, building shelters, medical clinics, hospitals, we promote and support Aliyah and tourism. And yes, for over a hundred years, we continue to plant trees. And we do this never making a single political stand because we are about people and not the politics. And so this is my tell. For some of you here tonight, I know I'm preaching to the choir. For others, this may be the first time you learn that JNF doesn't just plant trees. For all of you here, I wish you for you to deepen your involvement in this most worthy organization 
Continue to deepen your love for Israel, the land and its people, and deepen your financial commitment to JNF and any of its affiliate projects that touch your heart as Macomb did mine. I want to thank you for your time and attention. The power of women is felt and admired and respected by JNF. We represent over a third of the entire national campaign. Thank you for this first step in joining and becoming a member of the Women's Alliance with your $360 gift. We invite you to join other Women for Israel giving societies. For example, our High Society at $1,800 is accompanied, I have it, by our beautiful pendant that is in the shape of Israel with diamonds. I also invite you to consider being a Sapphire Society member, JNF's major donor society for women with a minimum of $5,000 gift. With every additional gift, an additional diamond is added to the pin, eventually totaling 18 diamonds. I'm very proud to be wearing mine and I'm still a work in progress. Though this year's event has been via Zoom and we've had to pivot like the rest of the world has for these past months, my fervent hope is that we shall once again enjoy this evening together next year in person. And I hope to be sitting in the audience and listening to one of you give your tell. Thank you so much for your time, your generosity, and your love of Israel. Have a wonderful night. Thank you. Dr. Erica Brand is the director of the Mayberg Center for Jewish Education and Leadership and an associate professor of curriculum and pedagogy at the George Washington University. Erica was a Jerusalem fellow, is a faculty member of the Wexner Foundation, an Avi Chai fellow and the recipient of the 2009 Covenant Award for her work in education. She's the author of 12 books. She has been published in several publications, including the New York Times, The Atlantic and Tablet. Erica enjoys conducting interviews and moderating panels to get to know writers, thinkers and opinion makers and has been called the Terry Gross of the Jewish world. Erica, we welcome you to lead our workshop on the benefits of friendship. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Hi, can you see me? Hi. Now we can. Good. Okay, great. I, okay, great. Um, I hope everyone's well. It's um, it's so wonderful to see you all here. I have the gallery view so I can see all your beautiful, powerful faces. And I just want to share how meaningful it was to see that video. Um, first of all, uh, my high school, a friend of mine from, uh, from high school and college, Dorit Friedman, uh, who was a neighbor of mine when I lived in Israel, was in the video, and my niece was in the video. So two great surprises, and, and it really connected me, and I, I, I don't know if you're feeling this, um, my entire family on both sides lives in Israel, and um, just not being able to see my mom for so many months has been really painful. And so I encourage you to do whatever you can to support what uh, the important work that JNF is doing um, because it supports my family. It supports the people we love. It supports the nation we love at a transitional time, an important time. And um, and um, I'm just, I, I just wanna thank you, first of all, for all your sacred work. So we have, work to do tonight. We have thinking to do tonight. And I don't know about you, but eight months in isolation has really, has really made me think and rethink some of my own friendships, some of the people who matter, who is essential to my life and who sometimes doesn't make the cut. And that's what I wanna think about with you tonight because this is a powerful room of women. And I'm gonna call us a room and I'm gonna treat us as a room as if we were in the room together. I could shake your hand, I could give you a hug, I could give you a kiss and say, it's great to meet you. Because the power of friendship is one of the few things that's getting me through the day. And the question of who we choose as friends, who stays as friends is powerful and it's evolving. So I wanna share that one of my favorite teaching populations are, are, are seniors, senior citizens. And uh, although I, I obviously can't do any of that kind of teaching now, except virtually, but I remember uh, talking about friendship with a, in a senior residence not far from my home. 
And I, uh, I asked a, a woman, she was in her early 80s, who had just moved into a facility from another state. She moved to Maryland from another state. I speak to you from Silver Spring, Maryland. And she said to me, uh, we were talking about how, how, how friendship has evolved over time. And I said, well, how has it changed for you? And she, she was quiet and she said, Erica, all of my friends are no longer living. At, at 80 years old, I moved to a new facility and had to make new friends. And I felt sad for her, but I, I felt empowered by the fact that she said, no, no, don't feel sad for me. This has been a great experience for me to kind of reinvent my friendships and rethink what I'm looking for. So what I wanted to do is invite you into a Judaic world with me, an ancient world, an ancient friendship, see what we learned from there and extract that into thinking about friendship and specifically thinking about friendship through the lens of JNF's work. All right, so if you're gonna join me as I'm magically transporting you through my screen share to another universe. And this is a modern depiction of two of the most famous biblical friends and that's Ruth and Naomi. Um, and as you can see, there's this beautiful image of Naomi, of Ruth, putting some kind of, uh, you know, of, of garment over her mother-in-law, protecting a woman who's older. And these two women have suffered. And we'll talk about them in a moment. But I love the song, That's What Friends Are For. If you love this song, give me a high five. You know that song, That's What Friends Are For. So I want to tell you that when I was pregnant with my first, who is now 29, and she's a physician and a first-line responder who's Unfortunately, just uh, just finished her her uh, COVID uh, her share of COVID, but she's okay now. And um, and I remember when I was pregnant with her, I was driving. I was living in Israel. Three of my four children are were born in Jerusalem, and um, and so I was driving. And um, this song breaks out on the radio. I happened to be driving in an area that was not particularly safe. And the song comes on and I start bawling. That is what friends are for, right? I just was, you know, that hormonal mode that you are when you're, you know, pregnant. And I was, I really started thinking, what are friends for in our lives? And, and in, in a certain way, I've had a lot of uh, thoughts about evolving notions of friendship in this period during COVID. And I wanna share that with you. So take this image of Ruth. And the thing that's beautiful about the image of Ruth is that the friend that she has in her mother-in-law and her mother-in-law and her are not aligned by text or place of or by age or place of origin or um, or background. Uh, there's something that unites them that's more than that, and that's a mission and passion for the Jewish future. So I want to um, I want to actually talk about that story for a moment um, and and look at the first thing or one of the most meaningful things that Ruth says to Naomi. And I'll just read a little bit of Hebrew because Ruth and Naomi, Naomi, Ruth, if you remember the biblical story, it's only a four chapter story. Naomi, her husband and two sons leave at a time of famine. They leave Israel and they compromise their safety and their, and their lives. And, um, and Elimelech, Naomi's husband dies, her two sons die, and she's left with her foreign daughters-in-law, her Moabite daughters-in-law. And Naomi decides, you know, it's time for me to go home. It's time for me to go back to that, 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 that country of Israel, that place that, uh, that Bethle Bethlehem, Beit Lechem, that house of bread. I need to go back to my family. And Ruth and, and Orpah, her daughters-in-law follow her, and they're getting to that fork in the road. You know the fork in the road uh, where you might continue and someone else might not go with you. And Naomi says uh, to her daughters-in-law, go back. And one daughter-in-law goes back, but the other one says, but tell my roots, don't, don't push me to leave you. Don't turn back and not follow you. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I die. And there I'll be buried. And so this is a beautiful testament to friendship. And I don't know how many of you would say about a friend, you, where you go, I will go, and I, I'll be with you to the death. And I want to think about that as a testimony to a long-term relationship that's not only in this lifetime, but that carries through to the next life, in essence. Um, and yet, when she finishes this speech, Naomi doesn't say, I love you back. And it's really hard. Um, and I just want to stop the share for a moment to think with you about friends 
where you've expressed yourself, you've made yourself vulnerable, you've showed your love, but they're not loving you back. Anybody has been in that position by a show of hands, given a lot of love, but not getting it back? Okay, thank you, thank you. You know where I'm standing. And um, so I always struggle with this text. But I really learned something from my booby. I've learned a hundred million things from my booby, who uh, was a an Auschwitz survivor. She, my mother, and my grandfather reunited. It took a year. Both of them were in Auschwitz. My grandparents and my mother was in an orphanage in Lublin. My grandfather was rescued by the Haganah, was on his way to Israel, and um, and he found when he was in Italy, he heard about an orphanage that had been let out in Lublin. And he went back to find my mother. So it took them a year and they all found each other. Amazing, amazing story. And my grandparents were very hesitant to have friends because if you hadn't gone through their experience of the Holocaust, you didn't understand them. And if you had experience, if you had, you somehow reminded them. And so this idea of saying, sometimes we're in a place where so much has happened to us, where there's been so much loss that we don't really have room for another person. We don't have room for more drama. We don't have room for more emotion. And I think so Ruth and Naomi travel a distance, but they're not traveling it together. Uh, they're not quite in the same place, although they will, they will in some way um, work through this discrepancy in their relationship. And so for all of us who feel that we've been in relationships that haven't been reciprocal, we have choices. We can let go of those friendships. We can lean into those friendships. We can demand more of those friendships or we can say goodbye. And um, Naomi and Ruth don't say goodbye. They find some way to journey together. So I'm gonna share my screen again. And here we are. And what I wanna to turn to is a, a different sort of text. Um, first of all, in the Babylonian Talmud says, either friendship or death. And this comes out of a, a sort of thinking that without people who care about our welfare, who are compassionate towards us, who hear our stories, who amplify our pain and understand it and, and provide the solace that we need in the time that we need, without that, life isn't worth living. And in fact, it's not only that friends need to be there to celebrate good things with us, but Elie Wiesel once said when he won the Nobel Prize in an interview, that what he saw wasn't the friends who were with him when bad things happened, but he questioned the fact that when he was actually successful, there were friends who could not celebrate appropriately his success. So that's really a test of a measure of friendship. Can you celebrate both successes and also losses with your friends? Or to take the view of Kohelet of Ecclesiastes, two are better than one. They have good reward for their labor. So this is kind of a utilitarian approach. If one falls, they'll lift up his fellow, but woe to him that is alone when he falls, for he hasn't another to help him up. So I just wanna say before we do our main, um, our main study for the evening, I wanna just ask you, if you know people who are isolated right now, members of your family, um, uh, people who don't perhaps have some of the family a framework that, that you have who are going through this as singles, as widows, as people who are struggling with mental health issues, please make it a priority to spend time, to call, to text, don't wait. When we finish, just send them an email. How are you doing? Thinking about you, let's talk. Because I think right now what we're feeling is not only a physical isolation, but a psychic and almost existential isolation. And I want to share with you an observation that Rabbi Soloveitchik shared, um, who was the, uh, the head of the rabbinic program at Yeshiva University and really an amazing, amazing scholar and philosopher. He describes the beauty of community as people coming together and recognizing each other. And he, he shares a moment when a person walks into a, room, a crowded room. Remember those crowded rooms, those pre-COVID crowded rooms? Um, he walks into a crowded room and no one says anything to him. No one recognizes him, no one acknowledges him. And as a result, he begins to question his own ontological worth in the world. Am I worth anything if no one recognizes me? And someone comes up to him, and says, oh, are you Mr. So-and-so? I've heard all about you. And suddenly what's returned to him is his sense of personhood. And I say that because as Jews, 
we're so fantastic at reaching out to each other at providing solace and, and companionship to each other. But I know what it's like to walk into a room where everyone else seems to know each other and I don't know anyone. And I'm wondering if anyone is going to pay me attention, if anyone's going to say hello, because everybody's so busy talking to the friends that they already have. This is a time when people can't even have that experience and the loneliness is pervasive and deep and profound. So I just wanna leave that as a thought for you is to reach out. In fact, if you wanna really be amazing, you'll write a list of 10 people who would really benefit from hearing from you right now, people from your past, members of your family, and make an effort to reach out to them. It's actually such a profound mitzvah. And what you see from Rabbi Soloveitchik's observation is it's not about being friendly. It's about returning someone's sense of self-worth. So I wanna look with you at a text by Maimonides. And, um, and I'm not gonna do it in Hebrew, so it, today's your lucky night, uh, but Hebrew is our, because this is a group that cares so much about Israel, Hebrew is such a rich and important language. And when I speak Hebrew, it's really the language of my heart. So Maimonides, as many of you know, there's a statement from Ethics of the Fathers that says, make for yourself a teacher and acquire for yourself a friend. And Maimonides, who was a 12th century um, philosopher, a physician, um, and a legalist, uh, has a beautiful commentary on it, and I want to share it with you. So the first thing about make yourself a teacher, we don't say make for yourself a teacher. We say um, find a teacher or go learn or go study with someone. We don't say make a teacher. But Maimonides says there are people who are not officially teachers. They're not in, let's say, where I am in GW as a, in, a, in, a, in a school of education. They're actually people who teach us things by virtue of their kindness, their expertise, their generosity of spirit. And so you might say, you know what? I need a teacher to teach me how to parent my adult children, how to have greater patience, how to make a better casserole. I don't know. Those aren't official teachers, but they're actually people who you may have gotten a better SAT score, but they know something and you can learn from them. Basically what Maimonides is saying is if you wanna get a teacher, just open your eyes, with a position or posture of curiosity and a teacher will arise. In fact, I, I love the, uh, the Buddhist statement that when the student is ready, the teacher is there. Um, I think about that a lot with my graduate students. I'm kind of waiting for them to be ready because I'm waiting for them. Acquire for yourself a friend. So look with me here, we're in the middle of page six. And my mommy says, note the language of acquisition. In Hebrew, it's kane lecha chaber, acquire a friend. This is like rent a friend. Do you want to rent a friend? I don't want a friend. I rent a friend. I want to know I have a friend. I don't want to have to pay for that. So my mommy says, it doesn't say make for yourself a friend or become friendly with others. The point is a person must acquire someone who will love him, who will correct him. And as the saying goes, either friendship or death. And we saw that saying together. And if he doesn't find a friend, and I'm going to change it to if she doesn't find a friend, because we're, we're all women here. If he doesn't find, or almost, uh, if he doesn't find a friend, he must persevere with all his heart to the point of uh, seducing the other person to love him until he wins his heart. Pay careful attention. Don't cease from bowing to someone else's will until love is strong. As teachers have said, when you love, don't love on your own terms, but rather on the terms of your beloved. You know how on those relationships where you feel that you're always giving space to someone else and they're not giving in that space? Or maybe you call your friend and you say, you know, I have a terrible cavity, I'm in pain. He goes, you have a cavity, I have a root canal. And it's always the suffering Olympics. And so it's not loving on someone else's terms, listening to what they need um, and how they need it and being truly compassionate it. Um, but, uh, but when we can achieve that, Maimonides says, how fitting are Aristotle's words in this regard, a friend is a second self. So here's the part that I love, and it's fabulous, and you're never going to forget it. Maimonides says there are three types of friends, a useful friend, a pleasant friend, and a friend who ethically inspires and instructs. And when it comes to a useful friend, you know those useful friends? I have loads of them. Um, you go to Costco, I'll pick this up for you. I go to Trader Joe's, I'll pick that up for you. You need useful friends, right? They're the way there. It's a utilitarian relationship, but it can be certainly more than that. I'm going to give you my best example of the utilitarian or useful friend. For about 20 years of my life, I did carpool. 
didn't love it, but it just was something that we did. I don't know how many of you uh, used to do carpool or eight months ago did carpool, but carpool was a big part of a mother's life. And um, for a while, everyone in my life was really, it was a question of being useful. So I looked at everyone as, do you have a Honda Odyssey eight seater? And if not, I'm really not interested in you because at that time I needed people. And in fact, we have psychological research that people need weak ties in order to feel a sense of contentment and harmony. What does that mean, weak ties? That's really what you're talking about, useful friends. So you go to the grocery store and a person says, oh, hello, Dr. Brown, so nice to see you. Now, no one in a grocery store says that. I wish they did, I go anyway. But I feel sometimes, you see my name on a credit card, I'm here once a week, let's, let, let, be a friend, ask me how I'm doing and I'll ask you how you're doing um, or your dry cleaner or a colleague at work. These are what are called weak ties. They're not as strong as friends, but they're critically important in us feeling affirmed that the world is a good place, that we matter, that we're noticed. Um, in my exercise class, if I didn't show up, someone noticed and said, oh, Erica, where were you? Is everything okay? And we shared books and those were weak ties, but they were special ties. The second category for Maimonides is a pleasant friend. And if you look at the screen right there, it says there are two kinds of pleasant friends, a delightful friend and a trusted friend. Um, and I want to talk about a delightful friend and a trusted friend because these are both friends that give deep pleasure. You know, they're people who just delight you. you you're in their presence. They always make you feel good often because they give you lots of compliments. They always say something nice. Uh, they share a joke. They make you laugh. It's really just such a gift to be in their presence. And, um, and the delightful friend is someone you might say, oh, let's do lunch, because that's really what you mean at the time, even if you'll never do lunch. Uh, but that, that friend brings you some, some delight. The trusted friend is a deeper level of pleasure. There's superficial pleasure. In other words, there's just that feeling of, of, of kindness and love when you're in, in, that, in that person's presence. But the trusted friend is someone who you can share your confidences with and they won't judge you and they'll accept you and they'll love you for who you are. And we're lucky in our lifetime if we can find such friends. For Cicero, who wrote a book on friendship and I didn't have time to quote it here, but it is in this um, source sheet. For Cicero, friendship, uh, was about loving people who you can trust and who are like you. Uh, that friendship exists among, he would say, good men, we'll call it good women. But for Maimonides, there was another level of friendship. And that's the last level, and I want to talk to you about that. So if you look at your source sheet, you look at the sheet in front of you, it says, when both friends yearn for and are directed towards one goal, namely the good, they are to each other ethically inspiring friends each one will want to be helped by his friend in achieving good for the both of them together. This is the kind of friend we are required to acquire. What does that mean? Here's what my mom is saying. You can't, some friends are out of our league. They're just smarter. They're better. They're more moral. They set a high ethical bar. They don't gossip. They're not petty. They, they, they study, they exercise, they grow, they learn. There's something about them that's just better. And Maimonides says, that's it. He says, have useful friends, have delightful friends, have pleasant friends, have trusted friends. But you better make sure in your life, if you want to grow as a person and be better, get a friend who's out of your league. Someone who you actually have to work hard to bring into your life on a regular basis. And Maimonides shares that that can be the relationship between a student and a teacher, but I think it also can be the relationship among friends. So we're gonna put you in breakout rooms and I want you to share, I want you to think about someone in your life who really inspires you, who might be that friend you, who's a little bit out of your league. Oh, I'm sorry, Celine, correct, is reminding me that we're not having breakout rooms. We're all a breakout room, thank you. Um, so I wanna invite you to unmute. If you have someone who functions this way in your life, maybe even someone from the Jewish National Fund. I actually have somebody. Please. From JNF. Great, um, fantastic. I, my husband and I just met her, her name is Rhonda Foreman. She is active in JNF in the Boston area. 
and we just met because um, a mutual friend of ours when we were in Israel, we have a place in Beersheba, we have our apartment, mutual friend of ours, an Israeli said to Rhonda, who came there to volunteer, he said, oh, you come from America, do you know, do you know uh, Ellen <laughs> Jack Kaplowitz? And she says, yes. <laughs> so, so I invited her over for a Shabbos meal and we started to talk and we were immediately friends. We had already met, actually, we were some, we were, went to Middlebury College together and, and we didn't even realize it. But um, okay. the main reason I'm saying that is because she so impressed me. She comes to Israel for a month every year. She goes at six o'clock in the morning to help out in this wonderful organization. She works hard in Boston for JNF. And she also helps children, teenagers at risk in Beersheba wow. when she gets back from her other volunteering. She is somebody I aspire to be like, and she and I have kept our, our correspondence going and I just love her. Gorgeous. Ellen, have you ever told her that? Yes, I did. And I also made a donation to JNF in her honor. Oh, isn't that special? Well, I know when you were talking, there were other people nodding. So I assume that lots of people we know her. Lots yeah. of people know her. And, um, you know, one of the things that was very striking, I used to run a leadership program here in the DC area. And uh, in one of our first classes, we were talking about mentors and uh, three people in the room. I asked people to describe a mentor and three people in the room wrote the same person who was also a mentor to me. And what I learned is, uh, and that woman actually was in the room, which was such a delightful and beautiful, uh, a beautiful moment. But what I learned from that is that there are people in this world who are constantly seeding new leaders, who are constantly out there for the cause, getting new people involved, just planting ideas, uh, taking someone out to coffee, which unfortunately we can't do. We can only have virtual coffees now, but the latte has no caffeine. Um, just, just enabling people to, oh, Rhonda, you're in the room. Rhonda, we need to meet you. Where are you? Let's go. Let's go. I'm Rhonda, here. where are you? Oh, Rhonda. I'm right here. Oh, tell us the secret sauce. And I'm blushing. Because <laughs> yeah, I'm like so taken aback by Ellen, what she said. I love you too. But um, what's the secret sauce? Um, I had a mother and a grandmother who are the most nurturing people I've ever met in my life. And they've instilled it in me as I am in, have instilled it in my <clears throat> now adult children. And um, it makes me feel good to nurture and to give of myself and to open myself up to meeting new people and helping people. And, um, and I cherish friendships and I appreciate Erica, what you said about getting rid of those that are not meaningful to you, which I have done, which was a hard thing to come to, hard thing. to know, but meeting people like Ellen later in my life and other people have been joys um, and, and friends that I will cherish forever. So thank you so much, Ellen. I'm like completely <laughs> verklempt. <laughs> yeah, good, be verklempt, be verklempt. We need more moments like that. And um, Rhonda, I so appreciate your, your sharing, um, you're sharing a little bit about your backgrounds and what inspires you and the women who inspired you. Um, you know, and thinking a little bit about getting rid of toxic friends, right? And was saying, you know, who's toxic in my life and, and, and maybe not been the best influence in a certain stage in life. I think we're all needing more inspiration. We need to feel good about ourselves. I have a friend, um, she's, she, she is, she's the friend who compliments everyone who walks in the room. I mean, you could look terrible and she'd tell you, you look beautiful. And, and she'd tell it to you so you almost actually believed her. And I have to say, that over all the years, even though we might not have the most in common, I mean, she's also about 10 years older than I am, but she's been one person who has stayed in my life. She's been an extremely important role model for me. I once gave an assignment in a class um, that, uh, that a class that I met with every week that people had to keep a compliment journal. And so I'm gonna invite you to do this because after all, what else are we doing? We're not, uh, you know, we're not, we're not living our normal lives. 
uh, to compliment 10 people a day and just write it down. Not the same person, different people, different levels of compliment. I'm not only talking about, I love your sweater, right? So trying to dig a little deeper and then come back and report how you did. So a week goes by and everyone thought I gave the assignment so that they could share a little love and make other people feel better. But the resounding experience that everyone shared was in complimenting other people regularly, they actually felt better about their own world. And that's research that we have uh, about the nature of gratitude, people who keep gratitude journals. But this is actually more specific of, of how do you get people to really gravitate towards you, to love you, to care about you. It's really about the love that you give. So anyone else want to share a special person in their lives who's someone who is inspiring for you? And why? A woman. Maybe someone else who's on this call. I will speak. Please, Janet. Um, and she is here. She probably knows who she is. And that's Phyllis Solomon. Mm -hmm. And Phyllis has been a friend since um, she's far older than I am. She's 10 years older. And we met when I was only five. We moved next door to her family. And uh, she has been an incredible inspiration to me over a lot, a lot of years. I'm, I saw five about 20 times or fewer. Um, there was nothing that Phyllis can't do, doesn't want to do. Um, from teacher of the year for New Jersey to Chabad woman of the year to, and I am sure I'm leaving out many of her, um, many of her accomplishments um, a president of a foundation to honor the memory of her family, um, JNF and the Gaza envelope that is her um, special place in JNF with a sense of humor and an ability to go on and on. Um, I don't even know what to say, but she has made a tremendous impact in my life. We don't always see eye to eye politically. We can listen to each other and then go, oh, <laughs> um, and, and um, the friendship, the love, she is family to me and she is a very special person. So she is a friend um, <clears throat> that is the friend that I needed to find. So thanks. And she's here. And she's here. Where are you? Phyllis, are you here? Do we have a rebuttal? <laughs> <laughs> Any words? I want to make sure that you have a chance to speak if you'd like to. Yes, here I am. Uh, I'm so touched. Uh, I'm ready to cry. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. We um, need a good cry. Cry away. Uh, Janet is um, the love of my childhood and my mm -hmm. adulthood. And um, our hearts beat together. And I thank you, Janet. You, uh, you have touched my heart tonight. Mm. Our yes. hearts beat together. What a, what a beautiful, beautiful thing to say. Our hearts beat together. I know Cheryl, you wanted to join in. So please. Cheryl. Yes. Hi. Hi. I want to agree about Phyllis. I met Phyllis um, in 2014. And she is an extraordinary inspiration to anyone who is blessed and fortunate to cross a path and an extraordinary example of a woman who really nurtures friendships and people. So I wanted to add the uh, cherry on the cupcake. Oh, isn't that nice? Phyllis, your evening. Risa, let's hear. Hello, Risa. You want to unmute? Hi. Hi. Um, I think this one friend is on the call. I mean, I'm very fortunate to have so many amazing friends throughout my life. Um, and I don't know what I do without all of the women in my life. But one of them I think is on the call tonight. I think it's Beth. Is Beth Moskowitz on the call? Yes. <laughs> Hi, Beth. Oh, how nice Beth. to see you, Beth. Hello, Erica. Oh, what a treat. I told Risa she had to be on this call because you are the number one favorite teacher ever, ever, ever. And I told her she had to study with you tonight. 
Thank you. So Thank Beth you. is a real inspiration. She's going to get all blushy, I know, because she doesn't like to hear people compliment her, but she deserves more compliments that I could give her tonight. She is not only an amazing friend and an amazing mother and such a learned woman and has given so much to the Jewish community in Boston. I, I can't even say enough. She's been honored by many, many different organizations and been the president of her temple and Jewish philanthropy and you name it. And anywhere I go, I mention Beth's name and people light up. They only have wonderful things to say to her about her. And not only is she a wonderful friend, I was very close with her mom, Edie, who has since passed away. And when I didn't have a mother when I turned 30 a million years ago, it was Beth and her mother, Edie, who surprised me with a birthday party. And Beth has been there since before we had children. It's, I think we were friends when we were three through our, her grandmother and my aunt, but I, um, I love her and I thought she might be here tonight. So I just want How to beautiful. I mean, I, I feel so for Clint myself. Um, <laughs> I, I have to know Beth, so I concur 100%, Risa, of my years living in, in Boston. Uh, Beth is the valedictorian of all adult education. So, uh, <laughs> but, but I, I think what's interesting is in listening to all of you, and I'm so happy for anyone else who would like to share, um, David Brooks in his book, Road to Character, talks about, um, he talks about two types of qualities. He talks about resume qualities and eulogy qualities. Mm -hmm. And resume qualities are the things that, you know, we feel like we need to impress people. And that might be all the things that you do, as opposed to your eulogy qualities, which is just who you are. At your eulogy, no one stands up and says, oh, and from this year to y this year, uh, she was employed by this in this company, or she got this kind of scholarship or this kind of award. Uh, the people who speak to you, and, and, and I think all of us in this room, I'll just say for myself, think about legacy, think about how we'll be remembered, think about the contribution, I, I wonder, am, am, can I, do I have the capacity to be that ethically inspired friend? that someone else might identify in a call sometime from now. Am I that to my own daughters or to my sons? Am I that to my sisters? How, how do I treat my mother? How do I want to be treated? Was, when you think about all the ways in which this, this could manifest and you say to yourself, at this age, at this time in our lives, it's not really about the resume qualities. And in fact, it's never been about the resume qualities. It's really always been about the eulogy qualities, but we don't have to wait till, uh, till we get close to the eulogy in order to live the kind of meaningful, deep lives and be the kind of friends who we wanna be. One of the things I've reflected on in midlife, I'm, I'm 54 and I've lived in many, many different countries. Uh, I've lived in England, I've lived in Israel, I've lived in different states in the United States. And I've reflected a great deal on, um, on certain losses of friends. And sometimes it comes because I've traveled to different places and made my life in different places. And some people are really great about keeping in touch and others, yeah, not so much. But one of the things that I've learned is that sometimes we lose friends because we lose interest, because they don't reciprocate, because there's some problem. And I don't know about you, but losing a friend is a heartbreak that was worse than any girlfriend, boyfriend heartbreak in high school or college. True or not true? And you kind of never really get over some of those things. And it actually, I, I think it in in certain way, anything that's difficult for me, um, that's been a learning experience at work or in life, I call my graduate school. So when something's bad, like I have a bad job, I'll say, that was my graduate school. It's where I learned what I really need in my life. And I think over the years, I've really been in the graduate school of friendship and I've learned who I wanna be with. I don't have all that much time. I have to decide how I wanna spend my time and who I wanna spend my time with. And that's become even more apparent during COVID of who I want to be with, who I wanna communicate with. So I, I wanna leave you with this sort of portrait, Maimonides portrait of the three kinds of friends we have in life. The useful friends that we have, and those are super important. We don't wanna minimize them, and Maimonides doesn't minimize them. They really help us get through the day. And then there's the special friends that we have, the delightful, pleasant friends, the trustworthy friends, the confidants. They don't only help us get through the day, they help us get through the life. 
They help us get through difficult times like this. But ultimately, there's some people in life who are a little bit out of our league. And Maimonides says, go after those people, identify them write to them, speak to them, love them, love them on their own terms, make them close to you because you will be better as a result of being in that friendship. And that's why I wanna to turn to Jewish National Fund because many of you have these friendships because a beautiful organization with a cause that's larger than the self brought you together. And I think that the friends that I've made who have been most important to my life share the philanthropic work that I do, the learning work that I do, the volunteering work that I do. That's where my kindred spirits are in the work that's important. And so although we can't all be in the same room and we can't all high five each other, give hugs and say, it's great to see you. I want you to feel in some way that the Jewish National Fund has brought you together and said, Let's be those kind of friends for each other. Useful because we support an organization. Delightful because it's great to be in each other's company, but ethically inspiring because the state of Israel needs us. And to bond together in friendship over the support of Israel, what could be better? Thank you so much for joining me. I wanna wish you a Shabbat Shalom. And I hope you'll reach out to all of those special friends in your life those who are isolated and those you love and let them know how much they mean to you. That this, this is a time of the world's vulnerability and it's, it's so meaningful to hear from the people we love most. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Erica, for an amazing evening. You have certainly given us a lot to think about. Our friendships are more important now than ever before. We sincerely hope you enjoyed our program tonight and wanted to share more with you about some upcoming opportunities. As many of you may recall, for the last few years, our Women for Israel event included our distinct Sheik Shuk boutique, where we offered all types of goods for sale with part of its proceeds being designated to JNF. This year, we invite you to shop the JNF online mitzvah marketplace. There are gifts for everyone to enjoy in all price ranges. Most importantly, these unique Israeli gifts support Israeli artisans and small business owners who are truly suffering now from the lack of tourism. This gives us a chance to shop with a purpose. Our next exciting event is the JNF Breakfast for Israel on Giving Tuesday, December 1st. Our guest speaker is Phil Rosenthal, creator of the hit sitcom, Everybody Loves Raymond, and currently starring in his own show on Netflix, Somebody Feed Phil. This special morning promises to be both meaningful and entertaining. Lastly, we are excited to share this. The Jewish National Fund National Conference will be held in Israel next October, 2021. We hope that you enjoy this short video inviting you to this trip of a lifetime. Thank you all very much. Oh, 
המסיבות של תל אביב. אבי חלם והתפלל לחיות בארץ ישראל. או היום ירדי אותי שואל מה הסיפור של ישראל? כאן זה בית, כאן זה לב ועוד אחד לא עוזב אבותינו שורשים ואנחנו הפרחים המלגינות שבט אחים אוספים ביחד נדודים, בתוך תרמיל געגועים. אדם נוף מולדתו, חורת קווים בכף ידו. דנה תפילות לנדרים, ריחות פרדס של הדרים. ובעיניה של אימי, תמיד אמצא את מקומי. על הגיטרה מתנגד, ניגון עתיק שמכוון. כאן זה בית, כאן זה לב, ועוד תח אני לא עוזב. אבותינו שורשים, ואנחנו הפרחים המנגים. של הסיפור, כמו שתי מילים להתחבר, 